Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Alan. On behalf of the crew of the show, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Bridging Heaven and Earth. I don't know about you what your week was like, but this has been a very odd and strange week for me. There's been just very odd things happening. Res the culminating, I get home one day from going to this very strange meeting for me, and then I get home and I get a call on the phone that a friend of mine who has been a teacher of the blind for like 20 years, has lived in Santa Monica for about 25, is married, has no record or anything, is in jail for armed robbery. He went into this convenience store and somehow the owner thought that he had been the robber who had robbed this, this man's store within the last month. So here it was, this poor guy is faced now with 22 policemen, six shotguns, and he's carted off to jail. Well, to make a long story short, it all worked out and he got out that night and they found out that it wasn't him. But I think that there's tremendous change happening and tremendous power and glory now. But, but parts of the duality are going to come out in terms of, of very strange occurrences. And tonight, I think we have a chance to really come home, to really come into peace, into a state of, of satisfaction and consciousness. Our guests tonight are truly extraordinary women. Uh, my experience with them, both of them, I haven't known them too long, but after hearing their albums and reading their books and hearing their tapes, that these people are coming into their, into their full power with real grace and real beauty, and, and more important to me, a real humbleness and a real sensitivity to the, to the oneness that, that can be experienced here. Uh, we have Judith Orloff, who's written the very well-known book, uh, probably inter an international bestseller, Second Sight, who's a psychic and a psychiatrist and a, a, the author of that book. And it is, although I'm not really a reader of books generally, when I started this book, it really struck me as a very, very beautiful experience. And what you can hear behind me is Lauren Green, who is a harpist and a singer who also has a uh, new album out, uh, Hand Woven, that I understand is in the top 10 of the New Age uh, list. So, but more important is the energy and the vibration that, that these people in their, in their expression of their love and their talent, the vibration of compassion and love that they put forth is what, what really inspires the crew and, and myself to continue to do these shows. So. I think we're in for an extraordinary, extraordinary evening tonight. So uh, join me, as we usually do at this time, to set a, a tone and a mood for the show in, in a short meditation. If people who know how to do a meditation technique, please join me with it. Otherwise, if you don't know it, just try to follow your breath for just a little while. If you want to close your eyes, if not, usually we put on some special effects so there's neat stuff looking behind me like something's happening to me. So let's get on with it. Please join me. Thank you. some excerpts from her new album, a new CD, Handwoven. Whenever you're ready, Lauren.
Hi, everybody, and I'm, I'm really honored to have Judith with us, Judith Orloff. So, Judith, welcome. Oh, thank you. It's great to be here. So, when we were talking earlier, uh, or when I was talking, I guess, I mentioned the word that, you know, you were a psychic. Now, how would you define what a psychic is? Well, I think the word psychic... I always psychic, like to start at the beginning. So. Yeah, the word psychic has been so badly tarnished in our culture. It's a very poor word because people think of psychics as gypsy fortune tellers or oftentimes when I've been traveling around, they equate it with the psychic phone lines and ask me if I can yeah. use my abilities to predict lottery numbers and all of that, which has so very little to do with being psychic. Um, psychic to me, the best language that approximates it is poetry. Um, it's metaphorical, it's deep, it's the deepest mystical language that can exist, that it comes through dreaming and it comes through sensing and knowing things about people and looking up at the moon and the stars and getting information from the moon and the stars, being able to connect, as you said earlier, with the oneness of things and not to see ourselves as separate from anything here on earth, to be able to feel the oneness and as a result of that oneness to know certain, quote, psychic things or visionary things, to be able to sit with someone and look into them and know certain things about them that they never tell you, but you just sense or know. So is it like, would you say it's like an increased intuitive power or what we've, what we've defined as an increased intuitive power, but your sense is that everybody has this gift. It's like part of what humans are supposed to know how to do. Oh, absolutely, but we're just never taught. As children, we're never taught to develop our intuitive skills. Uh, when children say things like, um, I don't like this person, when their parents bring home someone, usually the response is, how can you say that you don't know the person? When from a psychic standpoint, you never need to even say a word to someone in order to know them and to yeah, feel them. Yeah, we always feel, feel so great on a gross level, and there are vibrations, you can feel it. Oh, I mean, they're very subtle right. energies that children right. can feel in particular. Right. And so I've done a lot of work um, with children and their parents in terms of educating them, because if it started very young, if children really learn to appreciate the psychic aspects of themselves, then they won't run into the same problems that I ran into Yeah, you had difficulty up. as a child, I mean, you had a repress it and then you came into it and then you went to med school and repress it. Yes, so you've had yes, like an up yes. and down kind of, oh, why don't yeah. you just you know, kind of fill people in. Because yeah. your history was interesting to me. You know? Yeah, well I grew up as a psychic child in Beverly Hills and I had two physician parents who really didn't understand anything psychic and I would make all these kinds of negative predictions. I would predict things like deaths or illnesses or earthquakes and it was all quite negative and um, I didn't realize at that point that the reason I was picking up negative things was that simply in the beginning on a psychic level is a louder signal. That's it's all. grosser. Yeah, it's, it's grosser. grosser. Exactly. Right. It's easier to pick up, and that's right. why children get really scared of their abilities right. initially because they pick up things like all deaths. these horrors. All these horrors. Well, that aren't really horrors, no, but to us no, in our definition. Right. Exactly, right. exactly. And so my parents finally told me to never mention another one of my predictions to them again. Which was and very encouraging to very a Very encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I shut down at uh -huh. about age 10 and a half, age 11, and I thought there was something wrong with me in having psychic abilities and I never talked about my experiences for a number of years after that and I thought that somehow I was making these events happen that I was able to predict a common misconception that children have. Not only you were God. <laughs> no, yeah, but no, I mean, I is, yes. you think that, right? Did you, you do. Cause your you wonder. After? Yes, when right. I had the visitation from my grandfather where he came to me in a dream to let me know that he was going to die, I didn't realize then that it's a very natural thing. And so many people have told me that same experience around the country that they've known when their loved ones are about to pass on. But I didn't have anyone who said, oh yes, this happened to me too and it's a beautiful thing. Um, I thought somehow I had caused his death right. or somehow, somewhere, I didn't so know how. like guilt came in guilt, through this whole psychic. So I mean, not only were you fighting the external forces that it couldn't exist, but internally because of the negative experiences and guilt that you caused it. Right. So that I was a real know. encouraging experience. It was very difficult growing up as a psychic child and not having that kind of support. Um, and it took a number of years after that until I found mentors and guides who really took my hand and guided me through and said, this is not only a wonderful thing, you're very talented in this and you can use it to help people, you can use it to heal. Right. And that's the purpose for me of developing psychically as a psychiatrist and as a psychic. I use my abilities for love and service, period. Right. That's the only reason that I use my abilities. And for that reason, the kind of psychic information that comes through is oriented towards my healing work as a psychiatrist or in terms of service. 
and so that's how it comes through and I think it's really important you said the word humility before and it's so important when people develop healing skills or psychic abilities that they keep in mind how little they know rather than how much they know and I think where many psychics have really gotten into trouble is that they've gotten carried away with themselves and the psychic Ego is a very difficult thing. <laughs> very difficult it, it's very it's very very difficult and people get carried away with themselves they begin to think of how much they do know and then it's all over then yeah. you you, you, you know, it's interesting because in my experience is completely opposite the more you experience them you know it's like further up and further in I yes, mean, it's like yes. the more you get in it's like well you know it's just you're smaller and smaller I mean ultimately we want to disappear into that you know the the, the separate identity and stuff and the people think they want to add on but they really want to take off Yes, the, the identities and yes, like. yes. Well, we're so small, but we're filled with so much light. And the closer we get to well, our own the, psyche, right. the, the lighter we right. become. And it's about honing our spirits, getting closer to that light, and developing psychically. As you said before, I believe it's something everyone can do. And what it is to me is like lifting veils before the face and before the eyes so that we can see more clearly. And as those veils are lifted, it's very hard to look back and realize how little we knew before that um, because things become clearer and beauty and love becomes a lot clearer and healing becomes clearer. You can look at people and actually see them mm -hmm. and not see them as if from a distance. I believe that most people are asleep because they're not open to this kind of perception in an everyday way. When you say see them, I mean, do you mean like you can see, explain what you mean by when you say you can see, because we had the chat mules on and they have a certain thing when they, you know, seeing in the Carlos Castaneda tradition. Oh yes, yes. So, I mean, do you mean it in that similar way or just describe it the way you mean it? Um, actually becoming the person to see how they feel, to see how they view uh, the world, to become them and understand it from their perspective, to see who they really are as opposed to who they're presenting themselves to be on surface. And how would you, would you see that like with your eyes or would you like just know it? Well, I mean, how would you... psychic perception is, is really interesting because you see with your eyes, but with so much more than your eyes. Mm -hmm. You can see with your energy field, you can see um, with your stomach, you can see with your heart, you can mm -hmm. see with your throat, the various chakras, the centers of light that go down the midline of the body. Um, you can see through each chakra and begin to experience people on many, many different levels and also begin to hear how they're perceiving the world and what's important to them. And for me, to, to sense their suffering. It's so important to be able to sense each of our suffering because everyone has it. Well, everyone has a cross. Every, everyone has suffering. That's the nature yeah. of being here on, right, Earth. on Earth. So that no matter what they're doing on the outside, the suffering puts it in perspective. And so you can see it with more compassion as a result. Right. Would you say that the, the, really the first step in that is seeing that within yourself? Absolutely. Because you're your own yeah. experiment, the closest experiment oh. you are. Oh, always to look inside of yourself with such compassion and I know most people, myself included, have a tendency to beat ourselves up. That's just the way we were born, and mm -hmm. that's the way we were raised. And part of the spiritual path is learning little by little not to do that, to gain more compassion. And by seeing psychically, you can see good reason for compassion, because you can see the love and how, pe how hard people are trying to find themselves right. in this way. And once you can see that, all of their external well, actions take on a different see, my stance. experience that way is that if you see it in yourself, you're no different. Oh, no different. That's right. So, I mean, the closest yeah. you can see it is within you and like you know I always express it as like I've been given like almost every gift in the world in some ways and I'm still in some ways pathetic so I mean how about everyone else so I mean you know it's like and I have and, it, and it's not because I haven't tried in a way just because the nature of this experiment here on earth oh, because throughout yes. history we've had like five people who everybody's to this day is oh Jesus oh Krishna oh Buddha and everyone else I mean how could we have all been bad students now we are the real heroes right. Everyone is the hero. Everyone has that God quality in them. And the reason that I wrote my book was to say that I went on a certain path, and my path is no different than anyone else's. The psychic path is the same in many ways for all of us. And when one person goes through it, then it could be a little bit easier for the next person to go through. Right, like ants on a back crossing yeah. a river kind of. Yeah. Of course, some of us have to die to set the. But I mean, that's just the nature of like the human condition. Like. Right, exactly. But we need to join together in psychic development and spiritual development and support one another. Absolutely. It's so important not to do it alone. You know, we've been talking about that a lot on the show and the recent shows and, you know, about, you know, working together. That, yes. You know, in my experience, what, what needs to be happen now is that working together 
has to be more important than each individual's vision. Mm -hmm. Because so often I'm getting this vision, I'm getting it because I'm psychic, I'm getting it because I'm channeling Sananda, I'm getting it because I'm channeling. So, I mean, how can you possibly come to a, a middle ground? But there has to be. Mm -hmm. And if cooperation is really the key and mm -hmm. working together, oh, then okay. those things have to be, you know, kind of modified in a way. Oh, absolutely. And I think the more people develop psychically, the beautiful thing is that that loneliness that so many of us feel gets lifted because we can see that oneness in which we're all connected and we're not this unique being apart from everyone else. We experience it as yes, right. Yes, yes. But that psychic firsthand knowledge right. that we are connected, everyone is connected, it helps that deep inner loneliness that many people feel lived. Would you say that that, that loneliness uh, completely lifts or it comes and goes? The deep oceanic kind of oh, alienation right. that I used to feel as a right. psychic child. That you weren't even, you didn't belong here. No, that I didn't belong right. here, that I was an alien here on earth and I belong somewhere else. That has lifted. Right. Of right. course, loneliness comes and goes, but that deep human, sense. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, that right. deep sense gets lifted when you feel how connected everything right. is. Yeah, that's what's really important for us to have that experience. Yes. So I think now, I mean, I guess you've been hearing Lauren playing behind us, but she's going to play a second song now, uh, Lonely Willow. Here's Lauren. The bicycle was new, and so was her smile that went with it too. In the splash of a puddle, her dreams had come true. Over sidewalks, she sped on those speckles of red. Or were they blue? The bicycle, it flew, leaving lawns and grandmas and sadness behind. What a moment to love, what a day to be living. But when she returned to the hand, of the giving they were gone lonely willow weeps with pain and shame willow tree she sat for a while just to let the world be when a horrible thought like a pop in her head said maybe she didn't deserve that new bike after all confessions to a tree she'd hid in the barn eating berries and seed she lied when the wind broke that teacup, you'll see. And Daddy, he doesn't come home much to Mom anymore. questions that swim in her head about love her marriage it was new and so was her smile that went with it too 
The sadness she carried was dropped for a while But under the surface you know that it's true back with Judas. So when I was reading the book, the thing that was really interesting to me, the book's second sight, uh, was th all your case histories. And now I hear that you're not going to be a practicing psychiatrist anymore. You're kind of like, maybe, is that not, <laughs> did I make that up? No, that's not true. But you're traveling a lot, so I mean your practice yeah. is cut back a lot. Right? It's, yeah, my practice is cut back. Um, and I'm traveling a lot, doing teaching and workshops around the country. Um, and, but what's interesting is that since Second Sight has come out, I have now over 3,000 people on my waiting list to come in my private practice, which to me just says... That will be a busy week. It's a very busy week, <laughs> but it, it signals to me such a need around the country for people to be seen in this way, to be seen psychically and spiritually. And that's what many people are looking for in therapists now. And so that's the need for psychic therapists. And I think that's going to be the new wave in healthcare. So are you going out and teaching regular psychiatrists? My brother's a psychiatrist, uh -huh. by the way, so if you're New York, he could probably use it. But I don't know. He'll watch the show and he'll tell me. I don't think so. <laughs> so, do you find yourself like teaching the teachers now or teaching yes. the psychiatrists? Yes. So yes. You feel like that's more beneficial at this point in terms of like you know the gifts you've been given and the way you could serve right well that's one way that i serve but those three thousand people i take them all seriously they need to go see somebody who can uh, look into them in this particular way and so i'm beginning to train physicians and psychologists and mfccs and body workers to begin to bring this perception into their work it's such an incredibly beautiful sensitivity to weave into healing and the fact that traditional doctors don't use it, I believe, is a travesty. And it's beyond me how a healer cannot be a seer. That it's such a natural wedding to bring together being a seer and being a healer. Well, how could a human not be a seer? So, I mean, you yes, know. Yes, you yes. Know, it's, it's I mean, it's just true. the nature of the way we've evolved up until this point. That it's true. There's, you know, people just don't have that capacity. So. Or they don't know that right. they have, and I sometimes, mean, yeah, right. sometimes it makes me so sad when I meet people and, and they really don't have any idea of their own power. Sometimes it makes me cry when I see uh -huh. this because it's so prevalent that people don't know what they can do. Would you say that people are hungrier to know it now? Though? Yes. Oh, definitely. There are so many people who are just starving for this, to develop psychic abilities in themselves, to become seers. But I think even more importantly, to be seen because the experience of being seen is so precious and so beautiful when someone can see you not through the lenses of who they want you to be but through a very clear sight it's very empowering and healing particularly in therapy to be seen in that way and to be a psychic therapist is so different than being a traditional therapist because you develop this inner bond with patients that goes way beyond space and time and it goes into the dream realm it goes into other levels of awareness that are so intimate and so deep that it allows everyone to know what they're capable of and this is very new for yeah, people. Yeah, that's really exciting. Yeah, it's very so, exciting. So, I mean, you have in your book and in your tapes, uh, like different tools or methods of, yes. you know, encouraging or, or uh, perpetuating or bringing out the, the psychic powers, the psychic abilities. Yes. Do you want to like describe? I mean, you have meditation. I think you said was the. Yeah, yes, the meditation first is the most powerful tool because it teaches you to quiet your mind and find what I like to call that silent place where you go inside and it's just pregnant and you just wait and the answers come and the guidance comes the knowing the, the experience of knowing, knowing you know what my comes. experience is like the 
is that your bike is being held up from the back. You're protected. Yeah. You're safe. And from yeah. safety can come fear is the thing that you know represses yes. psychic power, everything. Mm -hmm. Love. Mm -hmm. You know, if we feel safe, then we can move to the next step, whatever that is. Oh, means. yes. And, and so I, I talk about meditation and I talk about the importance of building an altar in one's home, a sacred place where you can go and meditate, um, just a very simple place with candles and incense and statues of whoever moves you, Kuan Yin, the goddess of compassion moves me, so mm -hmm. I have statues of her all over the place, in my office and in my altar. And to be able to sit and meditate and pray in one spot all the time builds energy and it, you can create a, a safe space mm -hmm. in doing that. Right. And so if you meditate and pray in this one area, it's a way of connecting psychically there. And then another very potent way is remembering dreams. I wrote a whole chapter of Second Sight on remembering dreams. It's called The Alchemy of Dreams. This dreaming to me is the most natural psychic state because our egos are not involved when we dream. And we could go to other realms every night when we go to sleep. We can leave our bodies and travel in realms that are so unfamiliar to us when our eyes are open and we're awake. But when mm -hmm. we're dreaming, everybody goes there whether they remember mm -hmm. it or not. Right. And so many people have come to me saying, I can't remember a dream. I've never remembered a dream. And I taught them to remember. The people, Do you have people write it down when they get when they first awaken? Where? Yes. Is that yes, part definitely. Of the, the to, to keep a dream journal and to not wake up completely right away, to lay in bed and luxuriate between sleep and waking, so the door can be open and the images and the sensations can be retrieved. So, in a sense, we're not there. there there's not that big a demarcation. Oh no! If, because we we demarcate so many things in life. This is a, this kind of experience, and it's not. I mean, there's like a continuum of experience. It is. It's you like know, the twilight. It, right, right. It's like the doors of perception. Um, you just have to keep them open and allow that doorway to be open and that flow to happen. Otherwise, it's so easy to forget. We forget so much when it comes to psychic awareness and spirituality. And remembering our dreams is one way to remember who we mm -hmm. are. And so I teach people to do this so it's a way of life. So, and, and so you have a prayer, meditation, uh, ritual, altar ritual. Do you have other rituals? I mean, ritual is another word that has like you know oh, yes. funny connotations in a way. It does. You know, in this society, but but you mean rituals in the sense of, of a way to remember, either wanting to exactly. be conscious or being conscious. Exactly, it's all a way to remember. Right. However we can remember who we are, the better. And I'm always sending my patients off doing rituals. There's one of my favorite ones is the circle of stones where I send them to the beach on a full moon and have them build a circle of stones around them. And if they're very confused about something to put out to the universe, they want an answer to this and sit in the yeah, middle you, of the you circle. You have a beautiful example in the book of this Hawaiian model yes, who did that yes. and then decided to, to retire from what she was doing. <laughs> She'd had enough, basically. Yes, I'm not that it was had. bad, but just that she had had enough. Yes, it was not her true calling, right. and she was unhappy, and she got clarity in the circle. It's about remembering, about getting clarity, about acting from that inner place of authority rather than wandering around and not really knowing what the right decision is. Ritual helps you to find clarity and helps you to remember. And, and why do you think it does that? How do you think it does that? It's a way of honing psychic ability and honing energy and being in reverence to the greater forces around us and invoking through that reverence guidance and going beyond the human mind to what is so far greater than that and allowing that gentleness and that love to come in and that clarity to help guide us. But we have to open up to that and we must ask for it. It will not come in and hit us over the head. Um, but if we go and we, we do a ritual, whatever moves us, and it can be a totally non-religious ritual or a religious ritual, if that's what's moving to you. And each person knows what moves them. They can feel it inside of themselves. And they should never do a ritual by rote. It has to move you, it has to call to you and be very alive. And so when you do it, it takes on an incredible life and it brings answers in ways that traditional psychotherapy can never bring answers. Because it's a very organic connection to nature, to the universe, to one's own soul. And, and plus the fact that it becomes yours. It becomes it comes, yours, right. It's from within you. It's, it's from within, absolutely. 
And so I train people in my psychiatric practice to do ritual, to do prayer, mm -hmm. to meditate, to have an altar, to listen to their dreams, to be able to sense energy, to learn that energy is a reality, that we have these flesh and blood bodies, but we have these energy fields also that extend way beyond the body. And as psychics, we can sense energy. And even very simple exercises like going to a party, you might be talking to someone and they might seem like a perfectly nice person, but all of a sudden you get a headache or a stomach ache, right. something like that. You have to wonder, what is that? And begin to trust your energetic perceptions of what's going on. Uh -huh. And to have friends and support supporters in your life around you whose energy you feel resonant with. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, in my experience, what what has you know, if somebody asked me what two things I thought would be most important in the spiritual path, I thought learning how to—I mean, meditate, not just sit, but actually yes, have the experience yes, of meditation—and yes. what I would call holy company. You know, being around people who were you know inspiring and encouraging and compassionate and understand the nature of the spiritual path oh, so yes. when you fall and who doesn't fall you know yes. anybody who thinks they can't fall I mean just I mean I always say back up from them because they're liable to explode at almost any moment you know? uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, so well, to have that kind of support, I mean, particularly on the psychic path, because there's so many people who put it down or have misconceptions about it or raise their eyebrows or make disparaging comments, that that's enough to really discourage people in the beginning from going forward. Because um, I, I wrote an article from a calls magazine this year, and I received so many letters from people, and they were all telling me about their psychic experiences, and most of them... And felt, never told their husband, right, their right, mother... Right, 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 for fear anyone, of being called right, crazy. Right. And they just couldn't speak out about it, so they uh -huh. kept it a secret. And I'm right. convinced that psychic experiences are the most well-kept secret in this country. That people are having them all the time, but they don't talk to anyone. Right. And they well, don't, they don't know what to call them. I mean, they don't know yeah, what to make of it. That's true. They you know, don't. They're not supported enough to... That's true. And they don't talk to their therapists about it either. Right. Is they're afraid that their therapists would think they're crazy. And so they're in therapy talking about well, the most intimate... More pills. Yeah, more pills, but the most intimate them, aspects right. of their lives, but they won't talk about their psychic inner lives. Yeah, it's interesting because to me, the, the saddest part, they won't even talk to their, their mate, their, you know, their closest, no, they won't. you know, I mean, therapists are almost like, in the way I would look at it, one step removed, but, you know, yeah. those people were, you know, sleeping in bed with them, you know, till death to us part, we're not even telling them. Right, it's true. You know, and that's like the, you know, hello. Yeah. It's true, and so much shame is involved in having psychic experiences. The one great healing that has come for me from writing Second Sight and coming out as a psychiatrist and a clairvoyant is that all my fear of what people would think of me has, has been totally lifted, and I've received such... All of it? No, not all of it, but I a great deal. No. You got a little carried away. No, there. I did. No. Not all of it, but a great deal of it. Much no, I understand. This, I was Because I don't care that much. Every once in a while, I kind of care. Yeah, it and if I'm around up. my parents within two minutes, I'm like <laughs> sucking my thumb in a corner. It's like, how did this happen? You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it's so important. I know that therapists and healers out there are afraid of coming out because of peer review and so forth, but I only encourage them all, everyone who's listening, to be able to have the courage to come out. Because for me, I have mainly got positive affirmation for my work and has there been any negative experience like with hospitals or something like we're not putting this kook on our staff or something like that or that really has it i mean yeah. you have good credentials and good you know history so it really you know well you talked about in that book is that i mean that's why you wanted to go and get all the degrees yes i absolutely. mean to give yourself some credibility i mean to me always credibility is stupid either you have the gift or you don't either you can do it or you don't you can't but in this world i mean the only reason you're given your book means anything is you can put md after it it's true it's you know true. what i mean so you put those two together and, and that was the like the guidance you were given well that's what, even though it's hard for you <laughs> yes it's very very hard but um early on i had a dream that told me i was to get an md to become a psychiatrist in order to have those credentials to help to legitimize the psychic world and the credentials of md have been so useful to me i've gotten indoors that i could never have gotten yeah through. i told you earlier i'm a lawyer so i mean yeah. you know, it's like you know, we're, we're like a perfect Jewish sister and brother, uh -huh. you know, one doctor, one lawyer. Actually, uh -huh. my brother is, I told you, a psychiatrist, mm -hmm. too. So, uh, so I mean, where do you see yourself? You see yourself, in a sense, moving towards, like, expanding the awareness in, in a medical in a medical way or just in a human way or, in a sense, both? Are you going to be... Both. Both. Both, but, but very much in a medical way, too, because healthcare must be transformed. It is just you know really sad what has happened to healthcare, and that many physicians don't even talk to their patients anymore and it's a big revelation 
Yeah, yeah it's a big revelation if you talk to someone that it will do some good. And so I think yeah. this all has God to be. God should touch them. Yeah, touch them. <laughs> Nicely. Yeah, but, particularly if you're a psychiatrist. Right. You know. right, right, because then you could cross the line almost. Oh, yes, definitely. Right. Definitely. And so I feel really motivated in terms of changing health care and making it a much more loving, um, inspirational, visionary system as it should be. Yeah, I mean, it has such a potential. I mean, because people need help in the physical body and in the spiritual. You know, I mean, just all, f you know, we just need help in, in oh, a right. lot of ways. And, yes, uh, we do. <laughs> right. And, and because it's just, it's almost not available. It's like, I always find going to doctors is you end up worse generally. It's usually an unpleasant experience. It's, yeah, it's unpleasant and yeah. you're not healed. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, you know, every time people say, well, I'm going to go to doctor, I say, you know, wait a while and see if you really need to, you know. Yeah, but how sad that is. Yeah, that that's, absolutely. That it's come to that. And I, I think that's changing too. I've received so many letters from doctors who are just suffering tremendously in the healthcare system and that their experiences. With the just, HMOs yeah, now. That yeah, I mean, they're just yeah. horrid. There, yes, you know, the yes, gatekeeper it is. and you know it is but also with their own spiritual and psychic experiences they want to bring it more into the work but they don't know how and so um, I think doctors need to form networks and, and they are and in fact I just learned recently that there are 12 or 13 medical schools in the country that are starting programs on spirituality how could, how could I don't understand how a psychiatrist in particular could not bring that in if they get a sense a knowing that they wouldn't proceed on that in some way I mean, it's just, it's incomprehensible. I mean, wouldn't normally people proceed <laughs> at all times? I mean, especially someone who's trying to heal this person and deal with this person? I mean, it depends how that knowing comes through. When I started my practice in Century City and had every intention of it being traditional, I had a premonition about a patient's suicide attempt yeah, right. that came through loud and clear. But because that patient was clinically doing so well, I dismissed it. And it was that week. And I opened the book with this, that uh, she overdosed on the antidepressants that I prescribed for her and ended up in a coma. And so that was an example of why that I That was really listen. like a wake-up call for you. That like... was, yeah, a huge wake-up call, but I didn't listen. It was absolutely clear, the premonition, right. but because clinically there was no evidence to support it, I dismissed it. So you're it. saying you just don't get, people don't give enough weight. Yes. So it's like so far down there on the scale, you got to wait for it to actually happen because you can't trust it. It, it won't right. be given equal weight. Right. That's that the trust is key. Trust, is that, trust in it. Yes. Physicians are never taught to trust these kinds of things. It's okay for them to have a hunch about something or a gut feeling, but when, when you have actual information that comes through that could be quite contrary to clinical evaluation, we're not taught to even look at that. It's, 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 you know, it's like for, for some reason from where I'm coming from, I don't know. I mean, actually, I was in New York recently. I felt like, like Zirkel or some country bumpkin. I grew up there. I mean, but something of, you know, not to trust your instincts seems almost incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. I think doctors are, are taught to trust their intuition in general. But where I'm taking it is much more specific, right, much more specific and directly connected to spirituality and one's own spiritual uh, relationship to life. Mm -hmm. Um, and also to death, because I think fear of death um, permeates all of healthcare. Right. And from a psychic standpoint, it's quite clear that the spirit doesn't die, yeah. that the body is is gone, but the spirit lives on. And if doctors could believe this and know this, they could work with terminally ill patients and the help them way. cross over, over without yeah. that fear. So I know when I'm passing well, it's over. It's the fear of the unknown. It's the fear of the unknown. They have no psychic foreknowledge of what's to occur when they die. And so when I when I pass over, I don't want someone who's afraid of death looking at me. Right. I don't want them with me. You don't want them surrounding nope, you. I do room. not. <laughs> All right, well, I think it's time for uh, Lawrence uh, to play another song and sing for us. The Gray Cat, Cat's Night Prowl. So whenever you're ready, Lawrence. It's a dark, dark evening. The cobblestone street is just barely lit by a small moon shining through some rain clouds. From underneath the carriage steps a gray cat beginning a mysterious night.
Thank you, Lauren. That was beautiful. So now we're back with Judith. Now, my experience, and from what I got from the book, is that the end result for you is like experiences of love and compassion yes. as you walk through this this experience here on Earth. So, how would you describe that happening for you? Well, as I've been developing psychically, I feel like I've been getting closer and closer to that oneness that you were referring to before. And the nature of that oneness is love. The more you can feel it, the closer you get to it, you can begin to see it in everything. You see it in people's eyes, you see it in the ocean waves, you see it in the sunlight, you see it in animals, you see it in the sand, it's in the moon and the stars, it's everywhere. It permeates, it resonates, and you get more of an awareness of that love and you can live it more as a reality, not just as it means falling in love or being in love with a human being, but it goes way beyond that in terms of unconditional love to be able to feel that for all things no matter what you're going through and it's true when you're going through a crisis it's hard to keep that going sometimes but that's the spiritual challenge and through meditating and through doing ritual and through altars and through dream work that helps to substantiate that feeling of love so that when we go through the harder challenges of life we can have it there we're closer to the center yeah we're closer so to the center this, the the swings don't get so wide that right. we're way out there exactly and we can draw on it we can have grounding as opposed to not cultivating psychically or spiritually and then we're thrown into a crisis and we don't know what to do yeah i used to this person who was a very fine teacher used to say you don't want to practice meditation for the first time when you when the plane right. is going down you know, it's like it's a little late for that you know right. so so I mean that's why like with your 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 patients or your clients or whatever you call people <laughs> I always get that uh, your way of doing it is like to build this up as a as a consistent but that's what their life is about in essence. So it's a psychic lifestyle. Right, it's right. not just about taking a workshop or being in therapy for a few months. It's not about that. It's about a way of being in life, of being open right. and finding that psychic voice inside. Not putting God in your life, but putting your life in God. In yeah. Right. Yeah. But learning how to tune into that psychic voice so you can look to it like it's your very best friend and you can get accurate information no matter where you are in life, whether you're all alone somewhere or whether you have friends around you, it doesn't matter you can go inside and this is hard for people it is so hard for people to realize how powerful they are and I realize that's a human thing where it's very hard for humans to realize their spiritual power so part of my work with patients is to help them to find this um, with all of their resisting and and the problem with being a psychic therapist is that people tend to elevate you and put you above them and so part of my work so as you a, become almost like a demi guru well no I, I don't allow that but there's a tendency Maybe for a human being to put you on that there is because yeah. people can't own that they have this power in themselves so it's constantly my job to reflect that power back to, to people be a mirror over and over and it's it's right. hard work really because people will do anything to resist it and I know personally they know how much work I've had to do to come into a certain degree of acknowledgement of who I am it's very hard well, you had to have a lot of experience of it I mean as an idea it just unless you experience it you know it's like eating a, a, an orange I mean you know people can describe what an orange but until you experience your own power your yes. own glory yes. enough times enough times that you're rubbed up against it enough that you you know you're the magnet Yes, yes. You experience it's, yourself it's magnetically. True. It's true, and it's a state of grace to be able to realize who we are and what we give off, the light that we emit, the, our capacity for love and compassion, and what we have to offer this life. It's so important that people see this. And it's, it's hard work to uh, be a catalyst to allow people to see this in themselves, but once they do, and that seed is planted, it grows into the most beautiful of flowers, and it continues on forever. But I see my job as a seed planter, and then the seeds will be able to blossom. But we all need tremendous support in finding our own power and developing psychically and developing spiritually, and to be reaffirmed time and again that what we experience is absolutely real. It's not a figment of our imagination. It's not some uh, weird permutation of who we are. It's absolutely real. Our mystical experiences go far deeper than our minds ever do. We're just it's not just accustomed. Bigger. It's bigger. It's bigger, and yeah. we're not accustomed to validating and so we need to have others validate these experiences and say yes this has happened to me too and yes this is an incredible thing you just went through instead of denouncing it diminishing it taking it away explaining it away all, all these things that happen in our culture definitely we need to have that circle of support 
I mean, imagine if you went to a physician who can really support you in this, in your psychic and spiritual growth. And it wasn't always a fight and a push-pull, technology versus spirit, that it could all be one. And I think, you know, one of my main missions in writing Second Sight was to be a bridge between traditional psychiatry and the psychic realm and to say, I can be in both places and bring them together. And it's a natural part of our being to bring together all of who we are. The, these demarcations always seem so silly to me. You know, it's like countries. <laughs> it's like we go to border. It's like this other country. <laughs> you know, it's you, true. I mean, it's you know, all these. I mean, I think that was really one of the, the seminal things that happened at this time is when we went humans at this time went off into space and all these astronauts saw these little balls that I can't believe all this fighting that goes on, all this yes. separating. It's it's so small and so beautiful yes. and so blue. Yeah, it's so blue. You know, yeah. it's just such a beautiful thing. And then mm. here we are saying, no, I'm a psychic, no, I'm a psychiatrist, no, I'm right. a male, no, I'm a female, no, you know, all the ways that we find a way to separate. Yes, well, this is the nature of being a human being, is the separation, the duality, the splitting off, right. the duality, and part of spiritual growth is the oneness, the one. is bringing all of these things together in ourselves, the light and the dark and everything, everything of who we are, to bring forth our power, our full power. And then when we have awareness of this, we can have a chance of making some changes on the globe that can be positive. Well, I always, the experience is, I mean, if we really felt like the oceans or the trees were, you know, we, were one, I mean, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't treat it the same way, the same way another person, whether they have different eyes or different color. I mean, if we felt like they were really our brothers and sisters, if we experienced that oneness, and it, just everything would be treated differently. They it's wouldn't. true. It's true. And that's a, a psychic truth, to feel that oneness. I mean, there's some nights when I look up at the moon and the stars, and I ask them for my psychic guidance and he comes back because I resonate with them as one and as a result of the oneness the information comes through and for any of us to think that you can't get information from the moon or the stars or the oceans or from anything non-human I think is very naive and it's not psychically informed at all well it's like it's in a sense the way humans look at it, it's unreasonable well, what about this whole experiment is reasonable <laughs> you know, it's like we're hurtling mm -hmm. through space on this ball mm -hmm. and going through this thing with, you know, all the things we do yeah. and all the drama we put into it. Yeah. Well, but I mean, how is that reasonable? What about it is reasonable? Well, I don't know. And it's certainly not fun. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the whole thing is unreasonable. So why do we pick a part of it out and say, well, you know, this particular part, we can make this reasonable. Mm -hmm. It's only because it gives us boundaries. Yes. Against yes. the infinite. Yes. Because we're afraid of the infinite. Afraid. Yes. Right. Afraid of not being taken care of if we let um, go. Well, it's just, you know, why you put like boundaries on a beach for a kid because the beach is too big. Right. For the, right. For, you know, until we experience more and more and more. And until we experience how large we are. Yeah. Well, it would be, see, to me, the only way we can truly experience is internally. It's internal, yes. So, I mean, you know, that's where all, you know, all the darkness, all the light, everything is in us. If we think that any of those things that are going on with, you know, Kunan, and, or, I mean, we might not do those things, but if the seed of that isn't in there. Yes, I agree with that. You know, I mean, we should understand who he is in a sense. As you know, he is a part of us. Right. I know, and this is very hard for people. I wrote a whole chapter on this in terms of coming to uh, grips with the lightness and the dark inside of us as psychic truths, compassionately, as if we own these parts of ourselves, we have no need to project it outward, politically or socially, um, and we're able to really be accountable for who we are, not act it out, act that right. drama out on the globe and destroy it. You know the show's over. <laughs> it's absolutely over. Well, that's so, a good tone to end right. it. <laughs> so thanks for coming. Thanks, Lauren. Good night. God bless you. Watch us in two weeks. Next week, wherever it is, good night. <laughs>